We will start our uh, keynote lecture, and I have a great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Carola Hein and um, Dr. Tino Mager. Am I uh, pronouncing your, your name properly? Good. Uh, from Netherlands. Um, they both represent the Delft University of Technology. Uh, they will speak about adaptive strategies for water heritage, past, present, future. Uh, Professor Hein uh, is uh, the head of the History and Architecture and Urban Planning Chair at the Delft University. She has published widely on, in the field of architectural, urban, and planning history and has uh, tied historical analysis to contemporary development. Uh, Ms. Mr. Tino Mager studied media technology in Leipzig and art history and communication science in Berlin, Barcelona, and Tokyo. And um, since 2017, is a postdoc at the Chair of History and Architecture and Urban Planning at Delft. Uh, the floor is yours. After your presentation, we, uh, we will have uh, a session of questions and answers. Please. Thank you very much for the invitation. Oh, Michael. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thanks also a lot uh, for introducing us. So Tino and I will do the presentation jointly. I will start, and Tino will follow up. I don't know if you wanted to say a couple of words too. Yeah, just uh, good afternoon. Also from my side, uh, we are very happy to be here. Um, at this very well organized event, and I think this is the coolest um, <laughs> conference post I've ever seen. So congratulations for your visual communications. <laughs> yes, in the beginning it was really great, the pineapple. <laughs> um, yeah, as Carola just said, um, she will start and I will take over for the second part and in the end we will have uh, questions and answers. So, Yeah, and you should also feel free to interrupt if you have any burning questions that you would like to ask or comments to have. And I agree, this post is wonderful and I think we'll make some connections to, to in, the, in the talk. So what I would like to talk about today, and I have to a little bit figure out how I'm... Um, doing this here. Okay, it should be switching. Why is it not switching? Of the Indian? No. The computer sheet is there. Um, okay, I will, while we hopefully figure this out, I'm just going to walk and do this going walk and back. So what I would like to do today is talk to you about two connected things, and that's water and heritage. Usually these are two different fields. Water people are very important today. We have a lot of problems of too much water, too little water. You hear about it all the time in the press. On the other hand, heritage people are very important and have their own stories to tell. But in general, these are two disconnected fields and these areas don't talk to each other. So what we've been trying to do in this, in this program and what we're talking about today is to try and bring these fields in conversation and in communication with each other. And it just worked a minute ago, so I don't understand why it's not doing it. Um, so water is inherent to our life. Water is part of us, it's part of our landscape, it's part of our societies and about our lifestyles. Water is also one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, is number six. But many of you may have looked already into the Sustainable Development Goals and realized that heritage or culture does not really take a front in those descriptions. And I think what we would like to do uh, in this program is also to point out how not only the physical elements, but also the traditions, the ways of living, the cultures are necessary to promote sustainability through water, for example. Now, this means that we are not only talking about drinking water, which is important, but that we are connecting it to salt water. And for me, it's important to consider water in its entire circle. We, have, we need it for drinking, for consumption, for agriculture, but just as much, water has been used for defense, energy, and transportation. 
And often enough, when you look at port cities, which is one of my pet topics, you will see some planners looking at the transformation of waterfront, and they talk about water as being beautiful and blue and leisure and so on and so forth. And just a few kilometers further up, you will have the working port with its dirty industrial waters, but the water is the same. It just flows a little bit further. But the planning is disconnected, the heritage debates are disconnected, and they don't uh, link to each other. So on both sides, we want to look on the one hand at the buildings, the cities, the cultures, the narratives, and the daily practices in these various areas. So as the water systems are changing, as we have more droughts, more uh, floods, more climate, different climate patterns, it means that in the field of heritage, we have to think very carefully how we can connect those two elements. And I think there's challenges and opportunities. So for example, first of all, we need to understand how humans have lived with heritage over time. It also means that we have to figure out how we can adapt our heritage practices. A building that has been erected in a dry area and today gets more water, or maybe a building that was built for rain gets now snow, or the other way around, is no longer playing in the way that it was de 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 designed to be. So we have to find practices, we have to find new approaches to adapt the buildings, the heritage buildings, to climate change. And that is also one of the other elements comes into play here that is very important to me. I mean, I'm, I'm trained as an architect, so I probably can't avoid of coming from the past into the present. But for me, teaching history of architecture and urban planning, the idea is how can we learn from the practices of the past, not just to preserve, but to find ways to get inspired and to design the future. And remember that many of the buildings we will see were technical artifacts to begin with. They were top-notch engineering, and today we consider them heritage. So how can we learn from the practices that brought many of these buildings about to design the next round of practices. How can we analyze how the cultures existed around several of these water sites that we're going to show you to understand how we can better design and differently design these kinds of water sites. So what I would like to do in the conversation now is, and I'm just going to bring them up right away, is to look at a couple of different elements. And that's what I would like you to listen to and think about. So what is our definition of heritage then? I just had a conversation yesterday with my colleague, Case Khan, a building architect, and he basically said to me, heritage, well, heritage is everything that's around, what, what is around us. Well, do we all agree, or is heritage just a select type of building, or is it only a UNESCO World Heritage Site? We have to think about scales of heritage. Are we talking only about an object? Or are we talking about entire landscapes? Or are we talking about networks? And often we, our heritage policies are not adapted to design all of them. So think about it in the terms of water. If we think about water, we can preserve a water mill, but that also has a relation to the water streams. So how far do we go in considering or in protecting a, uh, a landscape. I already mentioned this idea from preservation to reuse. It's not only about fixing something in time, which is almost impossible today anyway, because our water system is changing. So we need to find ways to reuse. The practice of heritage, I think many of us in the room will probably have written reports about heritage buildings, about the history of buildings. Well, but how can we make these active and make it part of now new uh, reflection? And that is also the question of how do we act as academics, and I think several of you are probably teaching. Um, are we doing this just for us, or are we working also as public historians, as public heritage professors, trying to bridge those different discourses? And I think that's a very important and challenging theme often to do. And obviously, there's a question of how do we deal with technology, even in the technologies of representation. Colleagues in Delft have come up with this uh, scheme, which I find quite inspiring. So on the one hand, we have spatial development. We are talking about 
heritage as a, as a sector. It's something that is restricted up there and it's outside of spirit spatial development. We have to preserve a building that is not the central part of what we do. Now, that is the old approach to heritage. As you move further on and you think about from the 1980s, the discourse has changed into one that is more about heritage um, as a factor, as something that can be used. What we are looking at now, and this is also the, actually the title of a research program in Delft, Heritage as a Vector. How can we use heritage to achieve the sustainable development goals? And I think that's also very much the title underlying the presentation, um, the question here. So it's more probably, I don't even have to show these anymore to you. Let's just take a city like New York. New York is so important and became so important because it was a key port. And many of the buildings, heritage buildings, are buildings on the waterfront. As water rises, the typical form of New York is completely going to change, unless the architects get their will and they really build a seawall around New York City. Now, that means we have to reconsider the buildings that we already con consider heritage in New York, redesign them, adapt them, and this is just a way to give you one example of what is happening. Yes, the water is rising, so that means we have to deal with different levels, but that also means that the relation between salt and, and sweet water changes. And I think that is something that we often tend to forget, or I wasn't aware of also before moving to the Netherlands. As water rises, sea water, salt water pushes further into the hinterland, and in the Netherlands, they're growing new plants because the meadows, for example, the, the grass that exists cannot live with the new salinity of the soil. So you actually have to change the plants out as the, uh, as the, the uh, area, the border between salt and sweet water shifts. So there are all kinds of implications that are much more complex than just the height of the water. So, Given these kinds of ideas, there has been a movement in the Netherlands led by ECOMOS, uh, and apologies if I always walk in front of the screen. The idea is that we, and they started this in, the, in 2013, before I came to the Netherlands, the idea is we have to look into the urban deltas. And urban deltas, as you probably all know, are the most inhabited places around the world. Most of the big metropolises are situated in urban deltas. Uh, Asia, I think most of the 70% or something of the urban deltas in Asia, that's, that's where the biggest cities are. Now, 2015, one first book appeared on water heritage, and we are currently finishing another book on uh, adaptive strategies for water heritage. So the goal of this book is now to think to use these examples to bring back together to, get to examples on water heritage and at the same time to think about what this could mean for the future. And so this book should be out uh, within the next week or two and it should be open access so it can be freely downloaded. Um, first of all, let me go back a moment to the Netherlands to see uh, why, why would such a movement of trying to connect heritage and water come out of the Netherlands? Well, most of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the Netherlands are water heritage. So it's kind of obvious. Uh, the whole country has been built around water, around land reclamation. Uh, every, it almost feels living in the Netherlands that every square meter has been man-made and reshaped and has some relation to water. And so when you look at some of the most well-known elements, obviously the, the mills, many of these windmills were made to empty out water from low lands to create the so-called polders. So in the beginning it was wind, later it became industrial, um, like pump stations pumping out water from the, the so-called polders. And then the polder landscape emerged, which is really a very flat landscape. I don't know how many of you have been there with straight streets. Uh, the Dutch even talk about polder blindness because you, in your car you just keep on going and there's no corner, there's nothing that uh, stops you. But this whole landscape has emerged around the engineered intervention through water. So you have drainage systems, the water is being pumped out. And in this landscape, 
pieces of architecture have uh, emerged. So this is the Beemster polder. You probably have heard about it. Beemster cheese is very famous. So this cheese is very famous because the, um, the grass in there is very salty. So the taste of the cheese goes back to this whole tradition of having different grasses, having different water systems. This is also a relatively rich area. And when you look at the architecture itself, you can probably also guess that you have quite um, well-established people living in this area and cultivating the land. Then on top of it, you have a whole relationship between wind and, uh, uh, wind and land, so the trees protecting the old building from the, from the, from the, from the strong winds and the high uh, roof that shelters the whole thing. Another UNESCO World Heritage Site in the Netherlands is an island. Now I'm asking all of you to find the island. Can you find the island? So this used to be an island which was, um, so the land around it was dried up and the contour of the island, you can sort of still see this more organic line, this is the old um, coastline of the island that's still there. So when you walk around it, you have a pathway around it. You can sort of guess where the island used to be, the old village used to be, but it is all dry land now. It's just a meter or two higher than the surrounding area. So this is another element of where water has actually disappeared and it's still a water heritage site. The Vauda pump station is a 1920 built um, pumping station that basically keeps the Netherlands dry. So it, it's about keeping the sea water out. And you can already hear that I've been talking about very different types of water. Water inside the country, water outside the sea getting into the country. And this heritage site is uh, its a very well preserved and if you get a chance to go, very interesting pump station also on the inside with almost all historical elements, but it's still working. And then you have infrastructures like these built uh, across the coastline between two islands to keep the Netherlands, um, well again, dry. So you have a whole street across it. One of the big discussions here was the Netherlands have laid dry many areas, but what happens then? What used to be salt water turns into sweet water once it's cut off. So the whole fauna and flora, the animals, the plants, everything changes. So in the project of, this, of building this structure, they decided not to cut it off completely, but to keep part of it open so that you have a, contents, a constant back and forth of the, of the water. So these are some of the elements that um, inspired our discussion for the making of the book. The book is organized in five parts, and it's uh, together with ECOMOS and the Center for Global Heritage and Development. So I would like to talk you through the five parts that we've chosen, and all of these are kind of case studies. So we had a conference in Delft and brought together people from around the world looking at elements of water and heritage. So each of these elements tells its own detailed story. And then we've been trying to bring this together at a more abstract level. But it remains case studies. So there's plenty of work still to be done to, to construct a larger methodology, to construct a bigger theme on water and heritage. Now, to start with drinking water, and I think this is also one of the elements where you can easily see how difficult it sometimes is to get inspiration or to get the general public excited about it. An aqueduct, well, that's easy. An aqueduct is still something that tourists will visit, that can be marketed, that is branded. It's much more difficult already to understand that a city like Rome will not function without fresh water and the moments that the aqueducts came down, well, the city's population also got less. And until today, much of these uh, aqueducts still feed the city. So fresh water delivery, if you have some interest in engineering, is interesting. But what happens when the fresh water delivery is underground? So think about the New York um, the pipes, that the, the, the water supply that goes into New York City. It's a beautiful network, but you can't visit it. It's very much in decay. They have been losing a lot of water anyway. And then think about sewage systems. And so even if you wanted to visit a 
uh, a freshwater supply system visiting a sewage water supply system, a sewage system is much more of a problem. But still, we're talking about very important water heritage. How are we going to bring that to the public? How can we preserve it? How can we even talk about it? Uh, and many of these things are intimately linked to our, change, to, to our changing environment. It's much easier probably to talk about things like the, the water tanks in India, where historical practices, cultural practices, are intimately connected to the physical construction. I mean, this, 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 these stepped water tanks are beautiful, they're amazing, and the practices that go with it. But the questions that we can then raise as, as academics also are much more complex, and you can probably find them in any country. So in the book, we have one author writing about the decentralized water practices in the Netherlands that were typical. So where did people get their drinking water from? So traditionally, you could collect rainwater, or you had an, your own well, or you had all kinds of different practices that would vary from one area to the next, from one neighborhood to the next one over. Then public, a public system was built, and all of these decentralized practices disappeared. So one of the questions could be, what can we learn from those traditional decentralized practices, even for contemporary undertaking? And I think it's good to keep in mind and to remember that once we started building public infrastructures like the, the water systems, we are relying on it. So in the case, uh, for example, in Germany, um, you are paying, and I think it's the same here in many other countries, you're paying for the water that you consume. So as an individual consumer, you're interested in paying less and consuming less. And if you are, want to live sustainably, yes, definitely, you, you consume as little water as possible. But often the sewage system attached to it was laid out for a certain consumption that was much bigger. So the municipalities will often have to flush the systems that are apart from the houses. So in the end, what the individual saves in water and money, the municipality has to pay in water and money because the system was set up in this particular way. So that's why I'm thinking it's very important to not just look <coughs> to understand these buildings, but to look beyond them um, and to understand them in the greater context. Many of these traditional structures, and this is an ice house in, uh, in Iran, were abandoned. Again, often state control stepped in, provided a, an industrialized system for the entire country, and many of these traditional sites disappeared. So here the idea is that you can keep your ice for even almost a year in the ground, so you get the ice in the winter, store it there, there's an int intricate system, and Tina will talk a little bit more about the uh, other parts that are attached on it. But those kinds of knowledge and practices have disappeared. Sometimes, as I just showed with the Kanats and uh, the, 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 we're just talking about, it was a communal system, but it's not always the case. It can also be that it's very much about the aristocracy. So in this case, we have the, uh, the earliest water tower in the Netherlands, but that was built to water the gardens of the palace. So who actually has the money to invest in what kind of buildings also tells us a lot about, uh, we have to acknowledge that in our water heritage discussions. Now, moving on to agricultural water. And again, here I think we have a topic, it's not so visible. I mean, how many of you have visited a water meadow? Anybody? Okay, we have one hand up over there, but you have two, far, two, three, so four, five. Okay, but still I think it's a, and I should ask you now to explain what a water meadow is, but let, let me give you here a painting from, from Constable. Now, this is a very nice, beautiful landscape, but if you, how do you characterize this now as an engineering construction, as a ven vernacular practice of delivering water in a very measured way from a high point to a low point so that the meadow is constantly at the right humidity, so that humidity is distributed through agricultural lands in a uh, measured way. That's the point of it, and this technique is a European technique that traveled, and one of the articles is specifically dealing with that, traveled throughout Europe with, uh, there's, there's examples in Germany and Poland and so on, 
um, with the knowledge of the people who multiplied it. But these are practices that need both vernacular knowledge and they need a constant um, uh, care. So unless there are people who know how to deal with it, these practices will rapidly disappear. And they are not really visible. I mean, if you think about it from a tourism perspective, it will be hard to send people walking here and just take one little bridge to explain how a water meadow works. And obviously there are other much more, much bigger sites where I think more needs to be written about. You've all seen the beautiful rice terraces in, in China or in Indonesia. And there are very nice uh, studies, for example, by an anthropologist looking at cultures of conflict in Indonesia, showing that the fact of having always shared water from one terrace to the next forced or uh, brought about a culture that was much more um, adverse to conflict or a culture where the individuals had to collaborate and couldn't fight because you still had to share your water. So there's plenty of th elements that could be discussed. But even when we discuss these kinds of different stories and narratives, and I'm specifically using the word narratives here, we have to be very careful who builds them, who uses them, with what purpose. So one colleague, uh, Izumi Kurishi, wrote a piece in the book on Nintobe, uh, which is who's a samurai, who is celebrated in this area as having brought about a uh, land readjustment, uh, a um, um, water management system in a specific area. Now, the entire article tries to explore the fact how this guy, well, you see him in the sun here, were celebrated and established as this unique person, as this hero who brought about this practice, and she disentangles it to show that there were way more complicated influences that actually brought about this particular practice. And as we look into these storytelling paths, we can also look at land reclamation and defense. This is another example from Japan, which I find very striking. So the Hachirogata was a lagoon. And in this lagoon, you had a specific fishing practice. So uh, fishers were going for specific types of fish in this brackish water. So that was a heritage tradition, a very well established one. Now, the Japanese needed place for expansion for a construction of new housing. They actually had close connection with Dutch planners, polders, uh, who made the design for the polder that you see to the right. And this polder, this whole process of building the polder, of getting a new type of industry in there, of having a new type of agriculture, different from the earlier fishing tradition, is celebrated in a museum. Now, which story should we tell? Yes, it's a very important story about land reclamation practice and heritage. That's what the museum talks about. But the story of the loss of heritage of the fishermen and the practices they had and the lifestyles they had, that's not told. So even as we discover and discuss heritage, and particularly on that scale, um, we have to think about whose story do we tell, how can we make sure that there is a polyvocal history, a polyvocal heritage, so that at least the people whose traditions are gone are at least acknowledged and in some ways also celebrated. Um, I, I, may, I said in the beginning that heritage can potentially be a practice or an opportunity for design. <clears throat> and the Dutch waterworks are a very good example of this. So the Netherlands have a huge defense wall running through the country at the scale of a region that was built so that they could flood parts of the country against the Germans or other invaders. Now that system never really well, was very rarely used. Um, and what do you do with it? How do you preserve it? It's very hard to preserve a man-made thing at the scale of a region if you don't have a reason for it. So the one reason that they found was now and I think that's very smart, to use this same structure as a separation between salt and sweet water invasion. So if you think cleverly and you think at the scale of a region, instead of saying, I'm going to preserve this gate and this element and this, you can 
in fact translate, transform this entire regional area into a new barrier between salt and sweet water. As I explained in the beginning with say, um, water rise, this barrier, the, the separation between seed and salt water is shifting further inland. So the, that is another example of how historic preservation of, preservation of historical sites um, can speak to contemporary needs. What is also interesting and difficult, uh, makes this water heritage difficult, is for example the fact that much of it was, when it was used for defense purposes, that there's also a foe and a friend. So uh, if you take a fortress like Suanlini uh, here, you have all kinds of discussions going on. Well, who owns this Finnish, Russian, Swede? Whoever is in that uh, area and those kinds of whose heritage are you actually celebrating in these kinds of buildings. Now, let's take one more look at, um, at the foreign two, at uh, river and coastal planning. Um, and I think particularly in terms of river planning, there's a lot of work still to be done. And when we were just driving into the city, I was very curious, I, and I, hopefully in the discussion we can talk about it, what is going on on your river here and how much that is being part of a connected um, heritage. And when we look at, <coughs> when we look at this beautiful drawing of the river Elbe, uh, you can see that at least at some point in time, people were considering here Europe, um, all these um, countries, Italy, etc., around a connected um, idea, and the river became a part of the um, of the narrative of the depiction. And the river is one heritage in itself. Now often if we tell heritage stories, we're probably taking these kinds of pictures. And the Elbe can be in Dresden, can be a, an urban center, it can be in Hamburg, it can be the part of a new revitalizing waterfront, or it's the place where sheep and um, container ships encounter. How can we make a river the heart of a water heritage narrative that is actually continuous and often even crossing several natural, national boundaries. And river heritage, here's an example from uh, Alblasa Dam in the Netherlands. There are often ship um, construction sites, historic sites along the river. But the whole riverfront revitalization story that we probably, you all probably know from London and Baltimore and uh, all these other places, Osaka, Sydney, Melbourne, is much less discussed on rivers. So there's a lot of riverfront heritage, and again, I'm curious to see what's going on here, um, that is not yet celebrated. And when we go around the world, we'll see even other sites that are, um, well, that merit their own discussion and their own intervention. <clears throat> so let me make one more point here on ports and waterfronts, and then I'll give it to, to Tino. Um, the waterfront story is one that is perhaps the one that is most celebrated. As I just said, around the world we have had waterfront revitalization, and most of the time it's about some historic cranes and some old bridges and some docks that become the heart of a new development. And then we have corporate headquarters like in London, or we have leisure, Baltimore, and so on and so forth. So in the case of Hamburg, what I like about that example of waterfront revitalization is that they actually attempted to make it a multifunctional development. So in this, on the one hand, you have the preservation of the old warehouses and the structures with their transformation after the bombing of the Second World War. So those elements are still visible, but next to it you have housing for different classes, you even have a school, you have gardens, you have uh, different activities that bring it together as a new site of development. Now, these kinds of heritage waterfronts are not always successful. And particularly with cruise ships becoming really an anchor of the sea towards the land, lots of people traveling by cruise liking to step off the ship and directly walk into the places, what is possible in Hamburg, for example, in some places it is much less successful. Uh, one of the articles in the book talks about cruise ship tourism in uh, Curaçao, so on the ABC Islands, where lots of new 
fake heritage is being created to attract tourists. So while the historical site, historical cities are there, they are in need of repair, they are in need of new uses, they are almost put aside. Sometimes entire streets are closed just to get the cruise ship buses through. And these cruise ship buses will then be driving through fake sites where shopping malls and so on are in Zixland and where things are celebrated like this capsule in, uh, in the, I think, 1960s splashing onto the Grand Turk uh, next to the Grand Turk Island. So, kinds of fake heritage being constructed. I do want to end this part with a call for future heritage. What are we going to do about our um, container sites? That's the future heritage of port cities, or here in line with the call for, uh, for the, 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 the poster of the conference, what are we going to do with the oil sites that are going to be our future heritage. And I think the earlier we think a bit about it as future heritage, the easier it's going to be. And because these sites are not just clean up, in need of clean up, when you think about um, the, hurri the Hurricane ha Harvey here, for example, once a refinery is swamped, entire areas around it may be flooded. So that's, and I would like to give on this image here to, 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 to switch over to Tino, because I think that hopefully tells you the story why we need to connect heritage and water urgently, think about it in context, develop strategies of adaptation, and come up with ideas for future use. Um, so we, yeah, I just want to give you uh, another or an example on how we can make uh, use of heritage for um, to apply heritage in current technologies or technologies to solve future problems. Um, sorry. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Sorry. Um, yes. Um, so we go back to Iran and to a very ancient system of water supply called Kanat. I don't know if you're familiar with this, probably not. What you can see here is an underground tunnel that's made to bring water from a higher area in the mountains where there's a water table into a lower area, a village or an agricultural site. So within a country like Iran, you can imagine um, fresh water is something very important, something very valuable because there's not an abundance of water. It's a very arid um, climate. What you can see here, um, oh, can you go back one? Sorry. Um, the little holes that you can see are holes uh, that are made for maintenance. So people can go down, can enter the underground tunnel and can clean it and keep it up and yeah, can keep uh, the water flowing. So this is a system invented, now we can uh, go to the next one, thank you. This is a system invented centuries ago and it proved to be sustainable for centuries. It delivered water for a very long time uh, to the local population. Here you can see it in, in the scheme, you see this, this water table and the tunnel, that the blue line that is connecting the water table at a higher level uh, with a dry area in, in, a, in a flatland. And here you can um, now facilitate agriculture and bring fresh water to the people. And you also see these vertical axis shifts. So the cannot is not only used uh, to provide fresh water, it can also be used for another system. Um, this is a so-called uh, bad gear, wind towers. These wind towers are used uh, to take in uh, fresh air and on the, on the back side uh, the wind creates a suction to bring out old and warm air from an underground or a semi-underground uh, structure, room. You can see this dome here uh, in the middle of these towers. Um, this is an ancient system to, to create a cool place can go one more. So you can see uh, the principle here, wind is coming in, creates uh, a circulation, brings in uh, fresh air into a closed room, and the whole system can give, be combined with a canard. So the canard is under, this tunnel is under um, the butt gear, and a couple of hundred meters away there is an air inlet, you can see this on the right hand side, sorry, uh, with, a, with a red arrow, so uh, hot air is taken from the environment. And it travels along the cool water in the tunnel, cooling down, and it's being released into the butt gear. So this is an, yeah, an, an air condition. This does not um, consume any electricity. And nowadays, if you, if you want to if you make a building, if you create a, a, a building somewhere in the world, most places suffer from heat, not from cold. We live in a cold climate, but most places um, have to deal with heat. Uh, the logical solution is to, um, yeah, to, to build in air-conditioned systems, which consume, consume electricity and which produce even more heat to create um, the cold air. 
So this could be a system where we could learn from, that we could um, adapt, that we could uh, apply uh, into planning, into architectural design. Of course, this doesn't work everywhere in the world, but maybe for a couple of cases, this could bring a solution or could be combined with air conditioning. Next one. Um, yes, so the Persian Kennet is a World Heritage Site. So some select Kennets of Iran are a World Heritage Site. And they are also praised um, for their sustainability, uh, therefore that they um, yeah, facilitated agriculture and life in very arid areas over many centuries. What happens to this Kennet is since the 1960s, they were replaced by that. So this is the, the Kanat of today. It's a little fuel power pump, a diesel pump, and it's very um, cheap to buy. You can set it up uh, somewhere. You just drill a hole into the ground until the water table, and you take out the water directly from the ground. So you do not have to maintain uh, the Kanat. You, you can uh, collect your own water, and from time to time you just uh, refill the tank. The problem is in certain areas, for example, in a Tel Afil um, desert in Morocco, the water table over the last 40 years declined by 50%. In some areas in Iran, the water table um, went lower by 20 meters in the last 25 years. So the effect is that in, in very dry area, you make the area even drier, and you make the water table uh, in the end inaccessible because it's getting too low. On the other hand, the, the Kanat was working for centuries, it was working very fine, and it did not cause these problems that modern technology brought in in that sense. So this is where our reflection of heritage again comes in. Heritage is not only something which is valuable because it's historical, it's not only something precious or fragile that needs protection. On the other hand, heritage can be the richest source of inspiration for planning, for designing, etc. By looking at heritage, we find systems that prove to be sustainable for centuries, embedding a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience that we can make use of. And Carola just showed this, um, uh, this diagram uh, of the understanding of heritage as a sector factor and nowadays as a vector. And we want to facilitate uh, this understanding also with this Water and Heritage Project to understand uh, what we can learn from heritage sites and how we can apply this knowledge, this experience, together with modern technology, um, to solve uh, current and future problems. You see this here, this is a paper from a university in Seoul and a, a water engineering center in Tehran, how to apply modern technology, geotextile pipes, geomembranes into the Kanat system. So, by re so uh, the old system is revitalized uh, by the inter introduction of modern technologies. There's satellite monitoring, so you can see when you have to do maintenance at what part of the Kanat. So really lowering the effort to keep the Kanat um, alive, keep the canard working, and avoiding the problem of lowering the local water table. So this is a combination of a heritage idea, heritage technology, cultural practice, together with modern technology, and which provides a very sustainable solution. OK. Um, I just want to, to spend the last minutes to talk about this whole initiative. We had a big conference in, in May in uh, Taiwan, Chiai. Conference organized by the uh, Cent uh, global Cent uh, Center for Global Heritage and Development, ICOMONS Netherlands, and the Taiwan International Institute for Water Education. The, the aim of the conference was, as well as the other conferences already mentioned by Carola, to bring in people from the water world, from water engineering, from policy making, together with people from the heritage world, with heritage experts. Um, there's actually quite a lot uh, or a lack of understanding uh, for heritage uh, thoughts or for heritage sites, for heritage structures, or for how we conceptualize uh, heritage. I've been to Stockholm at the uh, World Water Week um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, this event takes place since 10 years, and we brought in a session related to heritage. It was the first time in the history of this conference that there was any session on uh, heritage aspects. And we talked to so many people, policy makers, people from big organizations, and they were completely unaware that heritage can actually be a contribution uh, to solve current issues. One more. And at the conference in, in Taiwan, we, uh, we took up um, aspects that are already dealt with in the, the book of adaptive strategies that you just saw, like the human services and waterscapes. 
as well as river deltas and ports. And we added a couple of new um, aspects, for example, canals. So I was very happy that there was a session on canals um, before this plenary session. Um, it was very interesting. And if you think about canals, these are very complex sites. It's not only the canal itself. There are also bridges involved. You have the locks. And you have to create a system that allows um, water transportation even among hilly landscapes. We very, find very old canals in, in uh, ancient China. And also, if you think about the Industrial Revolution, if you think about England, um, canals were a facilitator of the Industrial Revolution, um, allowing to transport coal from Liverpool to Manchester or coal Brookdale, and therefore the canals uh, used to be very, very important for that. The next aspect is water power. Um, water power is the oldest um, artificial source of energy. It's much older than using wind power than wind or using windmills. There are many different ways um, of how to make use of the kinetic or uh, potential energy of water. Nowadays, we build large dams with very questionable influence on, uh, on the environment. But if you take a look at um, the older structures, we see that there's a possibility to build little water mills, etc., just to support a local population. And here you, I show you an example of a floating uh, water turbine. This doesn't need any dam, etc. It's barely visible. It can be anchored in the middle of a river, just creating energy for a little community without much obstruction for the flowing of water and without much environmental impact. And the last point is uh, worldviews. Um, being from a Western world, we, we, we tend to forget these aspects, but water actually um, plays a very big role in uh, different kind of narrations uh, concerning the cosmology or also ancient philosophy. At the conference in Taiwan, we had a lot of people from Brazil, India, Australia, and they have a totally different approach to cosmology, to spiritual aspects of water that are sometimes very difficult for us to understand, and also difficult to approach scientifically. But for example, in a place like India, it's completely impossible to, um, to tackle these uh, yeah, issues of water, to promote the idea of heritage without reaching out to the people, and to their beliefs, and to their spirituality. And also think about the legal aspects, like, uh, um, yeah, um, we have a clash of, of traditional um, cultural practices, access to water with modern legislation, and also with companies like Nestle also questioning the right for drinking water. Yes. And last, uh, I would like to draw some attention to an initiative that was uh, decided upon uh, ultimately in Chiai, in Taiwan. So we decided there, with the help of the ICOMAS International Advisory Board, um, to found a task force and to go forward with uh, the foundation of an international scientific committee uh, on water and heritage. So um, this is uh, like the, the outcome of the conference that we want to uh, promote this uh, ISC. And we hope that at the General Assembly in Sydney in October next year, um, this ISC will be ready to be voted up on. And if we are uh, lucky and fortunate, we will have an established ISC on water and heritage. So we have an institution where this can, which can centralize all these aspects, all our um, aims that we want to bring forward. Okay, and within this ISC, or now within the task force of the ISC, of course, we focus on this strategic communication of uh, water heritage, of bringing together the water heritage, uh, the heritage side with uh, policy makers and engineers. It's about also about uh, engaging communities and stakeholders. And there's also the need for um, bringing forward uh, knowledge about adaption of water and heritage uh, systems, and also uh, thoughts about how we can um, revitalize water heritage or maybe sometimes abandoned heritage. And of course, it's important to bring the, in these aspects into education and into engaging uh, young professionals. So just uh, three of the, of the aims of the, of the um, planned ISC, so developing methodologies, training and policies. Uh, the second thing is to bring forward best examples of best practice, because these examples are what, are what can convince people. So if you can show a good example of how we can make use of water heritage, this might be convincing also for the engineering and the policy making side. Okay, and uh, apart from this, we are promoting the Water Awareness Heritage Shield. This has been awarded to several heritage, water-related heritage site in, sites in the world. This is a sideline of the ISC. This sh should just create uh, awareness and attention uh, for making use of knowledge embedded in heritage.
And as a last point, uh, I want to draw your attention on an upcoming conference at the end of November at the Delft University of Technology, Heritage and the Sustainable Development Goals. So if you have never been to, to Delft before, um, this is a chance for you to go there. It's a very beautiful place, full of canals, uh, full of traditional uh, architecture. You may know Delft Blue and also um, maybe Jan Vermeer. And it uh, would be a great um, opportunity for you to dive deeper into questions of heritage and sustainable development goals, how we can use, make use of heritage, of heritage knowledge to fulfill these um, sustainable development goals. Yeah, we thank you for your attention and now we are open to your questions, suggestions, critiques, etc. Professor Heinz. Dr. Magar, thank you very much. It was uh, truly inspiring. Uh, and I think uh, what is the lesson for myself, uh, but I, I also uh, hope that for some other people, is uh, to deepen our interdisciplinary approach to the heritage. And uh, we truly are living in our own um, bubbles and uh, we need more cross-disciplinary uh, uh, cooperation uh, on, uh, on such topics uh, because only in that way we can, on, we can also uh, work on the um, raise, uh, awareness, uh, 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 social awareness raising so that people are more appreciating the, the industrial heritage related to water. Uh, so, thank you very much. I also like very much this water heritage narrative. Uh, I, 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 do, do, I, I fully agree, I'm convinced it's very, it's very needed. From, from the house, I can say we made a, 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 a small a try. We published uh, one of our publications, we dedicated it to the Danube River treated it as a, as a river of memory and trying to see the, the, the Danube as, as a connecting um, uh, factor uh, and also that a, a factor that, uh, is, uh, that is important from many different perspectives. So thank you very much. And uh, dear participants, the floor is yours now. Uh, we have micro and uh, is there anybody who would like to to raise or comments or raise questions or comment on what we have just uh, heard. Well, uh, yes, there is Professor. I just checked it in my smartphone. It was the third day of creation. Uh, uh, that heaven and land were separate and water was separate and islands were created. So it's a very, very deep reaching tale uh, of uh, uh, Christian and Jewish tradition uh, that God created water and land. And I think this is still in the discourse. Uh, and I found it in, in, in the whole leitmotif of, of your talk. And I was wondering uh, about this divine and this somehow creative myth uh, background of thinking about water. Would you like to reply to that? Yeah, that, that's a very good remark. Um, this is uh, what I mentioned with this uh, section of worldviews. Um, interestingly, at, uh, in, in Taiwan, we had more the, let me say, non-European perspective on, on these aspects. There was, there was not a, a paper on, on Christian or Jewish aspects. Um, but as you mentioned, this of course this plays a tremendous role, and we also have the the water for the for the bep, uh, baptizing, baptizing people. So water plays a role in the, in the sign of of yeah divine blessing. Um, but we should further investigate this idea of like in the beginning there was land and there was water. This this separation. Um, which maybe show how important water actually is. It's not only a heritage or so, it is actually we are made of water to more than 50%. So it's really important, not only biologically, but also every cultural product is unthinkable without water. If you see the pyramids in, in, in Egypt, they only exist because there was a functioning water management system. So it comes into all aspects, but we should really develop further the, 
the religious thoughts or the, the yeah, Jewish Christian tradition related to water. And I, I think it's a really interesting remark because one of my architectural history professors was looking into the ways that churches were built often on underground rivers and that you were going with, how do you call this in English? The Wünschelrute uh, in German, but I don't know what it's in English. But I, I mean, even those kinds of things are usually discarded as not being scientific, not being appropriate. On the other hand, people look at Chinese traditions of looking for underground practices. So there's... I'm wondering, I, I don't know, but I'm wondering if there's a kind of certain resistance to bringing these discussions even into the heritage debates in Europe. So that's, I think that's a very good point to, to, to look into. The other remark I was going to make is, and again, we need interdisciplinary collaboration. How far is water embedded in our languages? Or um, I'm always tickled by the Dutch who have a saying that involves water for almost everything. It feels like falling between the ship and the, uh, the, 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 what, the border of the land. I mean, there's all kinds of words. Where are these words in our language? And for example, in Japanese, it's talking around the, the, the water pit. So there's for communal gatherings. I don't know if there's research on it, but I think it could go back and speak back to the point that you were just making. Virgil Rode is interestingly called it divining rod. Divining so rod. So even has the yes. connection. Okay. Correct. Is there uh, any more remarks? Question? Yes, there is. There is a, a man here in the. I don't speak very well English, but maybe it will be understood. Uh, my question is about the reused water, because we are thinking about the fresh water, yes. But the bigger problem, as I think, is to deal with reused water, how to make it good, how it was in the past, and to what problem are going to be in the future. Thank you. Did I understand you? So you're talking about refused sewage water, right? That's right. And uh, sorry to bring so many examples from the Netherlands, but in the in the Netherlands, if you see the west coast, you have a large area of dunes alongside the shore. Above it, you have Amsterdam. Below it, you have Leiden, Delft, Rotterdam. This is the area where the richest people in the Netherlands live, around Wassenaar and places like this. Interestingly, the underground is used for the cleanup of the water of Amsterdam. So there's a system that the water trickles through, and this happens actually, if I am correct, underneath the groundwater level. So they let the, 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 the dirty water filter through the sand, capture it below to get it back into the system. So, but I really agree, it's a big problem. It's not one that is something you can easily talk to tourists about, although that maybe is the thing that we should be doing much more. Uh, but to capture those kinds of existing practices and then come up with new practices, because when you think about the whole plastic cycle and the plastic that is being swept from all these rivers, particularly in Asia, into the oceans, and the microplastic that comes out of it, and, 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 I mean, there, that's where we need clever new solutions that potentially build up on on old solutions. I think it's a really important issue. Thank you. Maybe we can also think about this, that uh, nowadays we have a lot of chemical substances in the water cycle. And traditional systems may not be helpful in getting rid of these chemical substances. But we can take a look at these traditional systems and see how people lived without all these chemical substances. So maybe we can draw inspiration from that side. It's not a solution for everything, but uh, it can help to create a better environments and better engineering products. I also would like to comment on the, the relations between the heritage and uh, contemporary challenges. Uh, we are also um, we are involved in a project that is looking for some innovation in heritage or innovation and heritage. And we found a case from Spain where uh, in a desert, already desert land, the historians, archaeologists, archivists, they were looking for old maps showing the uh, water system uh, that, were de that was depicted uh, uh, probably in the Middle Ages. 
and they found the map and uh, and, and with their with this help this deserted already land can be um, fit with water again using the 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 research the uh, the, the old knowledge and i think uh, um, th this is something let's say optimistic that we can learn from the past at least from time to time and and i think this is a really important point so tino and i are involved in a project called time machine and the idea is that the big data of the past can enrich the practices of the future. So basically the point that I've been trying to make. And if we can discover waterscapes, so water practices of the past, and make them away available to the decision makers, but also to the general public, so that you trust alternative systems much, just as much. So I think this is an excellent example for how the big data of the past and making this public, digitized, openly available, getting more and more people to work on it, crowdsource this, to actually make it a contribution to the future. One last question before the lunch break. Yeah, I'm Henk from the Netherlands. So I'm one of the people who know what a water meadow is. I guess maybe the people here are more connected to the Flushing Meadows. I think that's more to, uh, to the high areas of Europe. Uh, but I have a question not on this issue, but on the issue of the, the different paradigms you showed eh, from factor. I, I look at Eva, <laughs> sector, factor, factor. So the, the third uh, paradigm is that heritage can provide new insights in, uh, in future developments and how to, to make use of heritage. But you should, you're also connected to uh, ECOMOS, which is, uh, which is connected to World Heritage, things like that. In my opinion, ECOMOS is not, uh, uh, not on that level of the third paradigm shift we have in heritage. They're quite dis traditional in the way they look at heritage uh, as a sector and maybe as a factor. So, um, and we have a lot of problems in the Netherlands, you know, with uh, protecting large areas uh, in dealing with protecting heritage. Is it possible when you protect a large area like the Dutch water defense line? Uh, so how can, we, uh, how can we connect ECOMOS and the people who are inside ECOMOS in the new way of how professionals nowadays and, uh, or heritage specialists think that you can combine heritage to, to uh, all kind of development goals or spatial developments and things like that. We have very different national chapters. I would say that ECOMOS Netherlands is very, very progressive, to my opinion. Um, Australia as well, they deal a lot with uh, water-related heritage. Um, other countries are more hesitant or more traditional. So every country has its own ICOMOS chapter, and this is defined by, by, the, by the members of ICOMOS, by the ICOMOS board within this country. So to create change, we, it, it takes a lot of time. Yeah? It's not a very fast operating system because there are so many hundreds or thousands of members worldwide. Um, but we promoted this idea for the first time at the General Assembly in Delhi in 2017, and uh, it was in, uh, yeah, it was really interesting how much support we received. People from the national com committees and the ICs, they stood up, they expressed their interest, uh, their support, and this gave us the motivation to proceed with this uh, idea. And now we are at this point that we have uh, yeah, the support from the advisory board uh, who help us to set up this IEC that we can be at the point to be voted for uh, end of next year. And yeah, I hope that this idea um, also create some yeah, rumor within ICOMA so that, that people open up to this uh, more, more um, say, uh, progressive ideas of what heritage uh, can be or should be. And, and maybe to add just one point, it, that's also why we have the Center for Global Heritage and Development between Leiden, Delft and Erasmus. And so ideas of putting a couple of students in studios on projects, just getting things done hopefully can also help rejuvenate ECOMOS. So I think if there's other things going on in parallel that are already pulling ahead, then the institutions will also hopefully follow, or at least the topic gets done. And that's, I think, what matters most to me. Thank you very much. Dear all, we are about to finish this morning's session and uh, uh, 
in a moment the lunch will be served on the, on the ground floor and the, on the first floor. I just want to remind you that we are meeting in one hour at two o'clock. We will start with two keynote speeches uh, by Hanna Skokanova and Niole Strakauskaitie, uh, and then we again split into parallel sessions. So see you, have a good time, rest a little bit, and see you soon at two o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you.